doing the the um, using the stylus on my tablet thing a little differently today, so bear with me if technology goes a little screwy. Um, we'll get it sorted out quickly. But for starters, let's go ahead and um, we're basically I'm I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a um, I won't call it a catch up lecture. Um, because we are still going to cover some new material, um, but it's going to be only 13 slides of stuff. And normally we do something closer to 18 in a lecture. And um, we're going to add a few things, but then do lots of practice as well. So, um, you know, we're only, all we're trying to do today is to finish chapter eight, and then we'll start on chapter nine on, on Tuesday. All right, so um, the two main categories of reaction we're going to look at today is, um, I guess there are three really, we're going to make epoxides, which are kind of a our three-sided ring structure, similar to some of those, those intermediates we've looked at. Um, and then we're going to look at a different category of reactions that actually does allow us to rearrange the carbon structure, um, as opposed to just rearranging or breaking and forming pi bonds um, we're going to which is called oxidative cleavage um, also known as ozonolysis which is one of the ways that they actually do water purification um, is to basically expose a whole bunch of, or, of ozone which is o3 which is a pretty reactive molecule they expose they basically bubble that through contaminated water and the, we'll see in a, when we get there that the reaction basically chops things up into much smaller carbon molecules, um, especially where we see alkenes. And so it's really good at breaking up cell membranes and any sort of lipid that is unsaturated because it basically just chops it up into smaller pieces, which can then um, means that you're denaturing your bacteria or your virus pretty well. Um, so we're going to cover those. We're going to start by doing um, some practice. Um, our practice we're going to look at is we're going to do the same five reactions we ended with the other day, but I gave us a different molecule to work with. So take a few minutes, um, work your way through some of these, and then we will go through the answers here in a minute or two. While you're working on this, if you want to remember our primary points for each of these, the, the notes that we had for each of these look like that. 
we'll start working through some of these. I tried to give you one that was a little bit different, but where we still had to pay attention to sin versus amp anti. So for starters, so if we're going to do the start at the top left with our boring um, anti-Markovnikov hydration, um, we're going to add an OH group to the less substituted, and it's going to be syn addition, which they're both the same substitution, right? So that shouldn't really make a difference in this one. Syn addition is not referring to where our OH group ends up relative to that methyl that's on there. It's referring to where we're adding the hydrogen and the OH. So we should wind up with a compound that looks like So none of the carbons change. We should wind up with a mixture of four different products, really. So we'll get some of that product, and then some of, some of the version that has the OH and the hydrogen switched. If there's no difference in terms of Markovnikov, Markovnikov's rule, if there's no difference in the two substitutions, we'll get both products. Something funny happened on a cartoon. I don't know if you guys can hear that. My kid's cackling in the other room. Okay. <laughs> so then our other, if we leave everything else where it is, wind up with And again, you wouldn't have to show the hydrogen if we're just drawing a skeletal structure, right? Um, and then we're going to get the exact same two products, except with both of the hydroxides pointed towards us as well. So we would get some mixture of all three of all four of those reactants, where the OH is cis relative to the methyl, where the OH is trans relative to the methyl on each of those carbons. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's keep going then. And look at Um, our acid catalyzed hydration, just or not acid catalyzed hydration, acid catalyzed chlorination. So we're going to start by making an intermediate that could then rearrange, right? Our stable intermediate is going to be the rearranged version where we wind up with. This molecule right and that all of a sudden takes away any sort of stereochemistry from that methyl group right because carbocations are planar they're only sp2 hybridized so they've got they have a trigonal planar molecular geometry because they don't have any electrons in that third piece of the p, p orbital which means Markovnikov kind of matters, but really it's more about realizing this one can do a rearrangement. And then anti versus sin, we're going to get some mixture of both again. But again, they're both going to give us the same product. Because... We can't tell the difference between chlorine up and the methyl group up, right? Because we're going to have 
we don't have a stereo center at this point because both directions around the ring structure are, are identical. So this is one of the few, usually acid catalyzed hydration is going to have more products than our other reactions because it goes to that carbocation intermediate where lots of stuff can happen. Um, in this case, because the rearrangement means it's going to favor just putting the chlorine on the most substituted carbon, um, we actually only get the one product. Then how about the, the oxymercuration reaction? Is that gonna, what is that gonna give us? Top right. Any thoughts? Is it the same thing? It's going to give us the same thing as the top left because it doesn't allow rearrangement. But Markovnikov doesn't make a difference if if we don't have if they're both secondary. So we're going to get the same four products that we got from the hydroboration reaction. And so the sin and the anti didn't wind up don't wind up mattering here either. So we'll get a product with the OH on carbon two, both cis and trans to the methyl group. And then we'll get an OH added to carbon three, both cis and trans relative to the methyl group. So the same four products. And if we wanted to get really picky about trying to order those, we could go along um, and we could say, well, yeah, we're going to get almost equal amounts, but maybe it's 27% this product instead of 25%. Instead of being exactly equal, we might, for the boring one, the hydroboration one, we might see that the, the ones that put the OH farther away from the methyl group might be very slightly favored or on the trans side, on the opposite side of the ring might be very slightly favored just because of the sterics. Um, but as they are both, and we, we saw that with the lab data as well, right? We, we had that one, I think it was experiment three, where both of our leaving groups were on primary carbons, but one of our primary carbons had an isopropyl attached to it. And the other one, it was an n-propyl group where it was a straight chain. And the isopropyl group made slowed down the reaction, even though we would have said, just looking at it on paper, well, they're both primary. So there, there can be some slight subtle differences that are going to mostly follow sterics. Just basically try to minimize big things running into each other. Um, but on the whole, it's not going to make that large of a difference. Um, as far as, as what our, you know, I wouldn't ask you on a test to necessarily pick out what is the major product if they're all going to be that close in terms of percentages. <clears throat> um, how about for the bromination or the halo hydrin formation with the bromine? What do we add if we do bromine in the presence of oxygen or in the presence of water? So with no water, we would expect to add two bromines, one bromine to each side of the pi bond, right? Having the water there just means the water is going to be our second nucleophile that adds. So we're still going to add a bromine on one side and our OH on the other side. And it's going to be an anti-addition. So we could wind up with if we wind up with our 
our bromines are really big, right? So if we have to choose where we're going to put that three-sided ring structure, it's going to be more likely to be facing away from that methyl group. Minimize, remember, remember that term, one, three diaxial interactions? Um, when we talked about cyclohexanes and, and share conformation and everything, trying to keep that bromine away from the methyl group because it's so big is going to wind up being a pretty important aspect here. So the bromine is going to be far more likely to go to the to the cis position. Sorry, trans position relative to the uh, methyl group. And then our OH is going to come in here and break one of these bonds. And add. Again, probably on the side that's farthest from the methyl group. Although, you know what? Hmm. If we put it on the other side, we don't get those 1, 3 diaxial interactions, right? Because the bromine is... We had the bromine here. And the OH group over here. The OH group has to be positioned anti. So the OH group has to be trans relative to the bromine. But if we put the OH group on the same side, closer by numerically to the methyl group, we don't get any 1, 3 diaxial interactions there, right? Because then both the OH and the methyl group could both be equatorial at the same time. Or they at least one of them is going to be equatorial, one of them is going to be axial, but they're going to be pointed in opposite directions. So that way they're not going to wind up with any clashes between the two of them. So if we were going to draw that as a chair conformer, If we wind up with the bromine trans relative to the methyl, so let's put the methyl right here. If we put the, that would mean that the OH group would go here and our two possible positions for the bromine Bromine would also be would be coming out towards us because I would put it on in the cis position. You guys remember doing this, I'm sure fondly, um, trying to flatten these things out in your head and make sense of what was cis and what wasn't. So, because the other position here would then make that the hydrogen, we'd have a hydrogen here. If we put the OH on the other carbon, it would be where the where the first hydrogen is, and then we have that one three diaxial interaction when you have the OH running into the methyl group more likely. But if we put the OH on the first carbon, we can minimize those one three diaxial interactions because nothing is axial at the same time that is pointed in the same direction. So if we're picking the main product here, this is going to be the main product. There are really going to be um, two primary products that we could have. Both of those are going to be the ones where the bromine is pointed away from the methyl group. That's going to be the bromine is the biggest thing, and the methyl group is the piece that's already there, right? So it's only going to have the bromine in the trans conformation relative to the methyl group, and then you're going to put the OH um, in the anti-configuration. And so we could potentially have it if we, the other possible product we could have would look like 
the methyl in the same spot. You could have the bromine here, and the OH would then be here. All right, but we're never going to put the bromine on the same side of the ring as the methyl group because sterics just wouldn't support that. It's too big and bulky to be to be in that position. It's always going to find a way. Bromines especially, they're being so large, sterics matter more here than they do when we're just talking about a boron. So we'd expect this to be our major product. And again, on a, on a test, draw all four possibilities do your best to order them. As long as you're showing me that you know, hey, I know that this reaction adds a bromine to one side and an OH to the other side, that's going to be most of the points. Getting the right, the right stereoisomer is going to be less important. It can be, I'm going to want you to think about it when it comes to full credit, but you could get an A probably on the test without, without getting this kind of answer right. All right, last but not least, for the hydrogen, hydrogenation. That's the easiest one, right? Is that a hydrogen to each side, which means we don't get any stereochemistry, really. So our answer would just look like methyl cyclohexane. doesn't matter where you draw the methyl at this point because we have two identical ways around the ring structure so there is no stereochemistry here and those two carbons that had the pi bond we now added another hydrogen to each of those which means that they each have two identical substituents attached which means they're not stereocenters either All right so we would just wind up with this product. Any questions on the review stuff so far? Anything you guys thought of last or since Tuesday that you wanted to ask about when it came comes to these? Will you screen share, please? Is it not? Oh, sorry, I thought it was. All right. So let's add our last few reactions for this chapter. Um, this is a pretty specific type of reactant we're going to be using here called a peroxy acid. So it looks a lot like a, a carboxylic acid, except we have three oxygens involved instead of just two. So normally a carboxylic acid, the shorthand would look like RCO2H. And if we drew out the structure, it would be R group, carbonyl OH. Right, and that's going to be fairly acidic because this, if you lose this proton here, you can wind up with resonance because we have a negative charge here on the oxygen and it can that negative charge can switch back and forth between the two um, oxygens right we have a, a different the other resonance structure would then look like 
of just get the extra charge moving over. That top oxygen holds on to the extra pair of electrons at that point. So the fact that you have resonance makes this an acidic compound because you can lose the proton and still have everything be fairly stable. You have a carbon ion or a, a negative charge on an oxygen that can be shared between two different oxygens. Um, peroxy acids are pretty significantly different, but they're also pretty easy to recognize. Actually, let me switch colors here. That oxygen-oxygen single bond that you get in a peroxy acid, that's actually a peroxy bond. You hear about peroxides. Peroxide means that you have two oxygens that have a single bond between them. Because usually O2, so a thought structure for O2 looks like this, right? Where you have a double bond between your two oxygens and everything has a stable um, full octet and your oxygens are held together by not just the sigma bond, but also the pi bond. Hydrogen peroxide is significantly more reactive, reactive than oxygen because you only have a single bond between the two oxygens. So peroxides are really reactive because it turns out that sigma bonds, oxygen, oxygen, sigma bonds, um, if you if you shine UV light on them, they split into make two peroxy radicals. And because it's a the bond itself is symmetrical, you wind up splitting up with each oxygen keeps one electron. So when you shine light on a per, on hydrogen peroxide, you get two OH radicals. We have an unpaired electron there, which is super unstable. So peroxy groups in general, anything where you've got a peroxide bond, it winds up being pretty reactive. Um, and this is no exception. So the shorthand we would see for a, for a peroxy acid would look like RCO3 with an H. Right? And so that's the shorthand showing you that you have this overall functional group. You've got three oxygens in that functional group all attached to, um, together, and that gives you that peroxide bond. And even if you ever see a a peroxide bond in a ochem reaction, even if you have no idea what's going to happen, your first guess should always be, well, I'm going to break a peroxide bond. I'm going to break it apart somehow and wind up with something that doesn't have a peroxide bond. We saw that with the hydroboration too, right? The second step was hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide together. And the, one of the first things that happened was you broke that peroxide bond. Um, so that's always going to be one step. If you have a peroxide involved in a reaction, you're going to—that's the active bond. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, the active bond is going to be the peroxide bond. Um, so in this case, what happens is we actually wind up basically just extracting one of the oxygens from the peroxy acid to make this transition state where you essentially switch the hydrogen over to the other side of the molecule. And that can happen in, because these things can line themselves up to be sort of a five-sided ring, which we know is relatively stable in terms of cyclopentane. It was a pretty stable molecule. They can all get, that hydrogen can get close enough to the other oxygen to sort of just transfer it over. And I'm hearing that some of you guys are having a hard time hearing me. Um, is that true for everybody or just a couple people with uh, speaker issues? Is Am I quieter than normal today? A little bit? I can do that. I can fix that a little. How about that? Better? Okay. Thanks.
All right, and so the what we wind up making from this peroxy acid is um, what's known as, as an epoxide. And again, it makes that three-sided ring structure that we're, we've seen before in some of our other transition states, um, or sorry, inter intermediates. It's usually an intermediate, but epoxides are stable enough that we can actually isolate them and separate them out. If it's a three-sided ring structure where you've got something that's still, um, that still has a charge to it, like that bromonium ion, that's not gonna be stable enough that we could really isolate it. It's gonna react with something else pretty quickly. But an epoxide is stable enough that we can wind up actually isolating it and calling it a product rather than just an intermediate. All right, and so the epoxide functional group is this single oxygen bridging between two adjacent carbons. So it's sort of like an ether, except that we're adding it, we're adding an ether between two carbons that are adjacent to each other. All right, so that's what an epoxide is. The difference between an epoxide and an ether, an ether, let's see, if we had, you can have a cyclic ether, a cyclic ether that looks like that. That looks like cyclopentane, where you've replaced one of the carbons with an oxygen. That's an ether because you have two oxygens linking, or sorry, one oxygen linking two carbons. What makes the epoxide unique is the fact that it's the adjacent carbons. Um, and then our other byproduct here is whatever our peroxy acid is, we just wind up with it turning into a regular carboxylic acid. All right, so whatever that R group was doesn't really play a role. So um, peroxy acetic acid is commonly used. Um, Casey, you asked me about one in last week's quiz that was a specific um, per peroxy acid that's used a lot. Do you remember what it was? Uh, MC... PBA. Do you remember? So I believe the B is butyric. The P is for peroxy. B is for butyric or butin butanoic. So that that would be the R group would then be three carbons long, be like a, a propane group attached. So PBA would then look like one, two, three, four carbons. The fourth carbon has the oxygen attached. looks like that molecule. So it doesn't really, that R group doesn't really play a role. Whatever's convenient, whatever you can order for your lab that has, that's a peroxy acid. If you're trying to do this reaction, it doesn't really matter what that R group is that's attached to the peroxy acid. All right, so why do we care so much about these epoxides? They're fairly unstable. Well, it gives us one more way we can add functional groups because if you then take that epoxide and expose it to an acid, really any acid, um, you wind up breaking that epoxide up and adding, especially if you have water present, you add an OH group to the other side. And so this is a lot like the halo hydrin formation. So the halo hydrin formation, we had a bromine made that three-sided ring structure, and then we had an OH come to the opposite side and attach, and that broke it up. This is going to be very, very similar, except now we wind up, instead of winding up with a bromine and an OH group, we wind up with two OH groups. And if one OH group is called an alcohol, two OH groups, it's called a diol. Di for two, OL for alcohol. So this allows us to add a diol or to create a diol starting from an alkene. So again, we're just, we're adding more ways that we can control what we're adding to each side of the 
of the alkene when we break the pi bond. Um, but our mechanism is all steps we've seen before. Proton transfer, we start by protonating the epoxide, which then makes it so that you've got a positive charge on that oxygen and it's going to break one of those bonds pretty quickly. And then your, if you, whatever your nucleophile is, usually water if we're making a diol, comes in and attaches from the opposite side, just like with the halohydrin formation. And we want, and then we have one more proton transfer at the end um, to deprotonate that that OH group that we just added. Um, and then pay attention, we do get the plus EN here. So that second nucleophile, the oxygen that comes in and attaches to the opposite side could attach to either of the two carbons. Typically the second oxygen is gonna come in and attach to the carbon that is more substituted if there's a difference. Just like with the, with the bromonium, we're gonna break the bond that is to the more substituted carbon if there's a difference between the two of them. If there's no difference, we get a little bit of both. Right, so if we wanted to make a diol, and this process is called dihydroxylation, um, the dihydroxylation is the same thing as, as saying making a diol. Uh, adding a hydroxyl group is, means adding an OH, like a hydroxide ion. So dihydroxylation means you're adding two OH groups. Um, so here's the, the reaction we just looked at in two steps. We start by making a an epoxide, and then you're ex if you expose your epoxide to an acid in the presence of water, we're going to wind up making the trans diol. And that means if we can make it if we have anti dihydroxylation, standard reason that maybe there's a way to make a syn dihydroxylation where we put the OH groups on the same side. And this one is a more specialized reaction. We're not going to make an epoxide. We make, we, it's only is observed if you have um, osmium-8 oxide or osmium tetraoxide makes this, this sort of, they refer to it as a cyclic osmate ester. That is not an, a vocab word I'm going to, to quiz you on because cyclic osmate esters only show up in this one specific reaction series. Um, it's not a common functional group. Um, but if you have OSO4, it's going to attach itself so that you wind up with the osmium, um, two of the oxygens from the osmium wind up making this five-sided ring structure instead of a three-sided ring structure, which is more stable. And then if you expose that to a um, basic conditions with water present, you wind up just breaking that OSO2 off and you leave behind two of the oxygens. So we wind up reducing the osmium slightly and oxidizing the, the carbon group that we started with. Um, and that's a way we can add two OH groups on the same side of the molecule. So this is, so far we don't have a lot of control over anti versus sin. We can control Markovnikov rule or anti-Markovnikov, but we're kind of stuck with Okay, if we go anti-Markovnikov, it has to be a sin addition. If we go Markovnikov, it has to be anti-addition. Um, this is our first reaction where we have control over do we go anti or sin. We can preferentially choose um, one of those isomers.
And just to recap the terminology here, if you have a mirror image of a molecule that's non-superimposable, that's an enantiomer, right? That's that plus en, it's R versus S. If you have a stereoisomer that's not a mirror image, does anybody remember what that was called? The diastereomer? Diastereomer. So the example would be if we have anti the transdiol, the mirror image of it, the enantiomer. Zoom in, you can see a little bit better. Enantiomer would look like this, where we just totally flipped it, right? And so those are two different molecules because you have two stereocenters and we flipped both of them. Diastereomer would be if we went from being the anti configuration within the trans configuration to cis because we're not going to necessarily flip. We're not flipping both stereo centers. Hang on, sorry. So this is not an enantiomer. It's also not the same molecule, right? These ones are both trans. The two OH groups are trans. Here's cis. We only flip the stereochemistry on one of those two stereo centers. So it's not a mirror image. So these two are diastereomers relative to each other. These two are enantiomers, are mirror images. The difference is if you have more than one stereo center, if it's an enantiomer, you have to flip both of, or all of the stereo centers for it to be a mirror image. Diastereomer means you would flip, you could flip one, but not all of them. Right, so the, these two different mechanisms that we're looking at here Um, are going to give us diastereomers relative to each other. We took the same molecule and put it through the anti-dihydroxylation versus the syn dihydroxylation. We'll get diastereomers. This lecture has lots of good review in it, right? Like to think about chair conformation versus an equatorial versus axial. Have to think about diastereomers. All that stuff we learned back last quarter doesn't go away really, huh? It's, just, it's almost as bad as a math class. All right. That's been 45 minutes of pretty, pretty dense material. Let's take our break. And like I said, it's a light lecture in terms of the number of slides and the amount of new material we're adding. So let's make it a 13 minute break. Let's come back at nine.
thought that this was relevant. Um, especially if you want your hexagons to look like a chair or a boat, then then OCHEM is uh, is your primary source of knowledge, right? Just try to explain try to explain to a mathematician how how you can make a hexagon look like a boat. Um, and they'll probably start throwing things. Anyway, let's go back to our one last reaction here. Um, and so this is the one that I was telling you about to begin with called ozonolysis. Um, and that's referred to because this compound O3 is, is uh, the pure form of oxygen known as ozone. Um, that's what's in the ozone layer is a, a significant chunk of the oxygen at the, in the ozone layer at a certain height in the atmosphere um, is present as ozone. Um, and it's predominantly because um, of the of the level and intensity of the radiation up there is capable of basically rearranging the O2 molecules that are that are present in most of the atmosphere and causing them to react with each other to form ozone, um, which doesn't look like it should be a stable molecule. If you look, if you try and draw a Lewis dot structure for ozone, you get, this is your Lewis dot structure. So here are all of our lone pairs. Um, so you wind up with it with something that doesn't look like it should be stable. You've got an oxygen with three bonds, so it's got a positive charge, but an oxygen with only one bond, it's got a negative charge, but that adds up to a neutral molecule. And you have a resonance structure too that looks a lot like the resonance structure for for the carboxylic acid, the deprotonated carboxylic acid, right? Where you could switch the negative to the other oxygen on the other end. So it's not a super stable molecule, but it's stable enough to exist, especially at a certain height in the atmosphere, um, mostly due to the level of radiation there. I mean, that's actually why the why the ozone layer is so important to life on Earth is because once you make ozone, it actually continuously absorbs light in that in that energy level. Um, and so that basically acts as a shield to make sure that the um, so that less less intense UV light makes it to Earth, which means that less stuff at the surface of the Earth, actually gets exposed to that really intense UV light. Um, and the the hole in the ozone layer is still an issue. Um, they've actually done some studies in the last 10 years or so. So it's predominantly because of the way Earth's magnetic field is affects CFCs and ozone itself. Um, the hole in the ozone layer is predominantly over Antarctica, um, just because of the directionality of the magnetic field. Um, and so they actually have measured, so people in Australia are more likely to have skin cancer than people in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but that could be a lurking variable because Australia is fairly tropical and fairly hot most of the time anyway, and people spend a lot of time outside. Um, they've actually seen an increase in skin cancer among penguins, which is interesting, um, that they think is that is directly tied to, correlated with, um, the decrease in ozone concentration over Antarctica. Um, and you wouldn't think penguins would be susceptible to that because they have feathers, right? But their feathers don't block UV all that well. Um, and the hole in the ozone layer is pretty much right on top of Antarctica. So they're getting exposed to a lot more UV than they did before the 60s. Um, it's interesting notes about ozone itself. Um, Ozone in the wrong place 
and lower in the atmosphere is also toxic. Um, that's a primary component of uh, smog um, is ozone. And you can actually track ozone layers or ozone levels around major cities um, versus, versus what time period you're talking about. Um, you can act, wind up with increase in ozone molecules at the surface level in major metropolitan areas at the same time that we're seeing a decrease in ozone levels in the troposphere where it's supposed to be, or at least where it's traditionally been. Um, so it's not a specific, a very, um, very healthy molecule to have around. If you guys um, have ever smelled, if, you, if you've ever been near to a lightning strike and it has a very specific smell to it, or if you've ever um, been done any electrical work and shocked yourself or has seen anything arc, um, to the point where you can see like the little blue lightning that you get. There's a very specific smell that you can associate with that. That's the smell of ozone. You're actually, it's the current passing through air um, turns oxygen molecules into ozone. Um, and so that sort of like, it almost smells like burning, something burning um, is, uh, is the smell of ozone, among other things. It can also be, you know, your skin burning or et cetera. Yeah, ozone generators are used um, a lot of times in air purification too. I mentioned its applications in water purification, but air purification as well. Um, and do those have a smell to them, Cody? Yeah, it's got a really distinct smell. It reminds me of those glass globe things where you could see like the electricity and if you mess with it, it kind of put off the same kind of smell. Yeah, those, those um, exactly. It's the same reason too. You're generating ozone with those just by passing current through oxygen, um, which is a, a very specific process. Sean, are those the, are those those air purifiers that you'll see at like Costco? They kind of make, they, it's like, because they just give up, they, they emit a, like a little smell that I feel like is the same description that Cody just gave. It probably depends on, on which one you buy. Because there's also air purifiers that that literally just have like an air filter, like you would have in in you know your furnace, um, that just literally filter out things like dust. Um, if it, so it, it depends on which kind you buy, but you certainly, they're they're going to be pretty similar. Um, and most air purifiers, if they do anything, a lot of air purifiers don't do anything at all, um, other than add pleasant smells. So they add pleasant smells. They don't actually do any filtration of, of other things. But most air purifiers that actually filter out bad smells and do that well are going to use some form of ozone because you can generate it really easily with a little bit of electricity. Yeah, an, air, an ionizing air purifier. Yeah, exactly. Cody, that's, that's exactly what I was – yeah, exactly. Um, anything that's a spray sort of air purifier, though, is going to be some combination. It'll still denature things, like stuff like Febreze will still break down odor compounds um but not using ozone typically and then it just sort of covers it up with a more pleasant smelling compound as well um so when we when we expose the reason that ozone is used for all these applications is that basically anytime ozone hits a carbon carbon pi bond um it has the ability to break it up and you basically cut the molecule in half right at the pi bond. So all you do with this ozonolysis is you're just going to cut right there and you're going to put an oxygen on each side of the molecule. So you turn one alkene into two carbonyls which all of a sudden is going to dramatically affect how polar the molecule is, what it's soluble in. Um, so if you do this, to, especially if you do this to any sort of bacteria, most, um, most cell membranes are filled with unsaturated fatty acids, right? That's what gives them that phospholipid bilayer. And so if you expose any cell to ozone, it winds up just basically chopping up the cell membrane to the point where the cell just falls apart. Um, and it's somewhat effective against other, other compounds, um, 
And so it'll still react with viruses to some extent. It's not as good at getting rid of viruses as it is at bacteria and other um, things that you can smell or taste. Right. And so the and the mechanism for this is a little weird. Um, you start with that ozone molecule and you make a five-sided ring structure um, that looks kind of like you would expect. That ozone molecule is trigonal planar electron geometry. And so it just comes up to that pi bond and sort of attaches to each side, similar to that osmium compound we looked at a second ago. Um, and so, but then you wind up when you do that, you wind up with this compound that's pretty unstable because you've got two peroxide bonds now, neither of which is being stabilized by um, by resonance as much, right? Because all of your your extra electrons are tied up in sigma bonds, not in pi bonds. And so this is a pretty unstable compound. This molozonide, molozonide, we just call it an ozonide usually. And just sort of sticks on there. And then what happens, like I, I mentioned, is one of the first things that's going to happen um, if you have peroxide bonds is that your compound is going to try and rearrange to break those peroxide bonds. So it goes through this process um, that's shown here where you wind up turning two of the oxygen, say, on one side, one oxygen goes on the other side, and it sort of just rearranges itself to get here where you wind up, you've now broken apart the carbon-carbon bond and it's put together and held together with these carbon-oxygen bonds instead. But again, you still have a peroxide bond that's not super stable. This one, this compound, this ozonide is stable enough that we could isolate it. Um, but if there's any sort of of um, reducing agent, a mild reducing agent, as it's put, is which basically could mean any sort of metal um, that's that's reactive at all. Zinc is commonly used, or DMS, which stands for dimethyl sulfide. Um, and that dimethyl sulfide is just CH3 to a sulfur to CH3. Also gives off. That's um, what you typically think of the smell of of rotting eggs is related to that compound. Um, and actually, you see this as a as an impurity in beer sometimes. If you if you make if your beer is not made properly, um, DMS gets produced by um, by the yeast when it's when yeast is strained when it's not healthy. Um, it winds up producing DMS in small amounts, which is not a particularly good flavor to have in your beer. Um, but it is good at, it's a mild reducing agent. And so if you expose that ozonide to DMS or um, zinc within the presence of water, it just basically breaks that ozonide up and turns it into two, two carbonyls. Um, and what's going to happen is that the extra oxygen winds up getting added to the zinc or the DMS. So you would turn, you would wind up going from dimethyl sulfide to dimethyl sulfoxide, which looks like DMSO looks like this. Basically, that sulfur can just grab an e that extra oxygen and hang on to it. Or if you put it in the presence of zinc, you wind up with the zinc turning to zinc oxide. It's where the extra oxygen goes. And the other two oxygens just stay attached to your carbons. And you break it apart to make those two carbonyls. All right, so the exact mechanism for that is going to depend on what our mild reducing agent is. So I won't ask you about that. Um, I'd be more likely to ask you to draw the intermediates here. The actual mechanism arrows, um, especially when it comes to that rearrangement the, from the molozonide to the ozonide, that's a weird set of, of reactions, of um, 
uh, equilibrium arrows. So I would be not very likely to ask you to draw that mechanism, but I might ask you to draw what are the intermediates and what's the final product for this reaction. So the intermediates would be the five-sided ring structure where your oxygens are put together, the ozonide where your ox where your carbon-carbon bond has been broken, um, and then your final product would be the two carbonyls. Um, and you might remember DMSO, that might sound vaguely familiar to you, that we use that as a polar aprotic solvent um, back when we were talking about uh, about SN1 versus SN2 and protic versus aprotic solvents. DMSO was one of our polar aprotic solvents like acetone. All right, so the last two slides I have for you guys are just a whole bunch of practice problems to work through here. So I will turn you loose on these, although I would suggest trying the ozonolysis. The, the other thing about ozonolysis is if there's more than one alkene bond, it winds up breaking all of the alkene bonds. It, I mean, you need more ozone to do that, but it doesn't preferentially react one place rather than another. So for this bottom right ozonolysis reaction, you're going to wind up breaking both of those alkenes and replacing both sides of the alkene with a with a um, carbonyl group. So since these ones are a little bit, the rest of them are all follow our our pattern of you break the pi bond, you add something to both sides. The specifics differ, but for the most part, they're all same fit the same formula. So let's go through this bottom right reaction together before I just turn you loose on these. And wind up seeing, going to break here and here. And the way that I would approach these is to kind of keep everything, redraw the molecule, keep all of the carbons in the same spot, and then just replace, and then break those pi bonds and replace with the oxygen. Um, otherwise, it's really easy to miss a carbon when you're trying to redraw these in a more convenient way. Start by redrawing them with everything in the same spot. Sorry, I'll go back there in a second, I'm trying to. That's what they need. All right, so let's again, I would start by redrawing your molecule. <clears throat> 
and then we're going to cut um, those pi bonds. And remember, don't get rid of any carbons when you do that. Make sure you're just breaking the pi bonds. And wherever you broke a pi bond, add a carbonium. So when you first draw that, that means they might look really weird when you if you didn't leave yourself enough room. Everything looks kind of cramped there. But once you have it drawn properly, then you can redraw it in a way that makes it easier to see what's happening. So you're going to wind up making this top molecule as acetone, right? Three carbons in a row, carbonyl in the middle. So we wind up making here's one of our products. Our other product winds up being six carbons in a row with an aldehyde on each end and then a ketone in the middle as well. So now that we have that drawn, we can say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then add our oxygens. And our pi bonds. So those would be our two products that we would get here, right? Doesn't look all that much like what we started with when you redraw it this way, which is why I recommend drawing it with all your carbon same in the same spatial arrangement first, and then add your oxygens, and then you can rearrange it however you want to make it look pretty. Not that you need to necessarily, but it's so it's a it's a simple enough reaction, but it winds up rearranging things in a way that it's kind of hard to get straight from what you started with to what you have at the end, right? Without drawing out some of the steps along the way. All right, so the rest of these are practice. Um, there's another page of practice as well. We've already done some practice going this direction. The next slide has practice going the opposite direction, where it gives you your reactant and your product and asks you what you have to do to do the for the reaction to happen that way. So more on the synthesis side. If you want to go from that cyclopentyl group with the alkene to a, let's say we're looking at going to that molecule. We have to look at that and say, okay, I added an OH group. It's the anti-Markovnikov direction. So my reagents for that one would be, it would look like uh, BH3. Ideally, remember to put the THF, but remember that's mostly just the solvent, so it's not that critical. And so that's step one. Step two was, and then you have to um, expose it to that peroxide and sodium hydroxide. All right, so this is good practice as well because it's it's making you categorize what type of reaction is it and work backwards is a good way to help you remember all these different reactions. Because I know clearly there's how many arrows on this slide now. Um, these are all the reactions that we've covered in this chapter. Right, so we've added a lot of reactions in this chapter. There's one elimination reaction. So other than that, these are all the reactions we've covered in this chapter. Believe it or not, elimination was only one chapter ago. That was chapter seven. Um, and we've you know come come sort of sort of a lot of stuff has happened since then. Um, 
but this so this one's a good way to and and i would approach it the same way okay what did i do to get from point a to point b i added an oh group and i added it in the markovnikov manner or if we're looking at this one that's a halo hydrant right which means we had to start by adding the the bromine and then add it with water add, acting as the nucleophile, right? So break it down into the steps. How did I get here? And that's gonna tell you what your reactants have to be. Um, and I'm thinking that, that I'm going to have you guys do these two slides um, and call that the quiz for this week. Do these last two slides and I'll and I'll pull them out and post them as a PDF as well. So it's you can still call it a quiz if you want. You could also refer to it as a homework assignment. My quiz is basically our homework assignments, right? Um, same same due date Sunday night as normal. And then we're done with chapter eight and we'll move on to free radical reactions. Chapter nine, I believe, is next. No, we have to do alkynes first. Um, which are going to be a lot of the same reactions, except we're starting with two pi bonds instead of just one. And alkyne is a pi bond, is a triple bond between two carbons. And since that's really a, still just a sigma bond with two pi bonds now, it makes sense that a lot of the same reactions are going to happen to alkynes as happen to alkenes. It's the same type of bonds, right? There's some subtle differences in how things will rearrange at the end, but it's going to be more practice with the same reactions for chapter nine. Um, and I think we'll be able to go through all of chapter nine next week, if I'm remembering correctly. But I will take the time needed to make sure you guys get this. Any questions at this point? Um, I was just thinking about the reaction with the ozone, are they introducing that in the form of a gas or? Typically, yeah. Um, in the case of doing water purification, you can have ozone, you either have an pure oxygen that you then expose to a current and then bubble that through. Um, or you can, I, I don't think, know if you can get ozone in a canister as a pure, I think you have to generate it in place because it reacts too too well even with the canister itself you'll wind up oxidizing the inside of the canister um if you tried to do that so i think that most of these but yeah it's it's not very salt it's a little soluble in water but it's not that soluble um, and it's not that stable on its own so most applications you have to generate the ozone from oxygen luckily that's pretty easy to do um just by exposing o2 to electrical current or uv light um and that UV light's pretty helpful in the, in the sense that UV light also will break down and destroy all these compounds as well, right? So um, as long as you're not shining it on people, then um, that's an easy cost-effective way to generate uh, ozone as well. So if you just bubbled ozone through a bunch of like toluene or something, it would just start tearing everything apart? Toluene would start reacting and you'd start with things happening but toluene being um aromatic having that benzene ring ozone doesn't react the same way with the benzene ring that it does to alkenes isolated alkenes so it'd be like the difference between burning propane versus burning styrofoam styrofoam doesn't burn as well you get a lot of leftover soot and stuff that didn't react um you'd You'd have something similar happen if you tried to re react aromatic compounds with ozone. Some of it would probably react, but not all of it, and not completely or predictably. Um, but anything, anything like olive oil, anything that's unsaturated fatty acids, if you bubbled ozone through it, you'd start tearing that apart pretty, pretty quickly. Um, now I kind of want to try that. Maybe I can find a lab for next year where we can maybe we can generate ozone and bubble it through olive oil and watch the olive oil fall apart. Actually, Sean, I have some uh, ozonated olive oil, but I don't know how much they lose in the process of making it. That's, so that's it. So they, it's probably in the ozonoid, ozonide form in that, that shape that looked like, that looked like this. 
um, which probably would probably don't use that for anything uh, related to cooking food that you actually want to eat. I would wait. Uh, no, 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 no. It's more of a medical application. Makes sense. All right. Well, that's that's all I have today. And so I'll let you guys get a head start on working on those um, problems. Um, I do have office hours, 1030 to 1130 today. Um, I'm available by email over the weekend if you need to. I'll get that assignment set up for you guys. It has the PDFs pulled out for you, but you can get started on your own. Um, and at, with that, I think we'll call this. And uh, um, oh, there was somebody caught a John caught a uh, an error in one of my examples from one of one of the recorded lectures. If you are going back and looking at the YouTube um, recordings, if you do catch any mistakes, just put it in the comments, and I'll respond to it. And either tell you why you're wrong or admit that I was wrong as, as appropriate. Um, and so if you if you do see anything like that, just let me know. And uh, I won't correct the recording because that's a lot of work, but I will put it in the comments. Um, so pay attention to that. All right. Everybody have yourselves a good weekend and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, Sean. Bye, guys. Thanks, Sean.